Shalom brothers and sisters and welcome back to the channel. This is the part three of the series, The Most High's People Are Called By His Name. And this is probably the most important part of the series, the final part. Now, I will leave the link in the description for part one and part two in case you haven't seen them. And they were used to build up some foundation that we need in order to be in the best possible place to understand this particular teaching. I believe without that foundation, this teaching will leave many people offended. And that's not my intention to offend, but my intention is to speak the truth by Yah's grace. So during this teaching, I would refer you to part one and part two so that you can build up that foundation. Now, the reason why I say that this teaching may offend many because the teaching will be based on the scriptures as always, but because of tradition, because of inheritance, because of our feelings and because of religion, many of the scriptures that we'll be reading, people have preconceived ideas about these scriptures because they've heard them so many times, because they've seen them or been taught them from a religious perspective, they will have a view on these scriptures as being something that they are actually not and they will not take the scripture for what it actually says. So my encouragement to you is even though you may know these scriptures, but is to listen to them as we go through these scriptures as to what they're actually saying, not what we think they mean, not what we've been taught that they mean, but what they actually say. The Most High did something very remarkable for humanity. He gave us a brain and the ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to use logic. Now, when you use logic and it doesn't line up with the word, you have to throw your logic out because the word always takes first position when it comes to deciding if something is true or not, because the word is infallible, whereas man's logic is fallible. But the Most High gave us logic and reasoning power and the ability to make decisions and the ability to think. That's why we are his greatest creation, because we have the ability to choose and repent and make decisions based on what we think is right. Now, the word is our guide and everything should always be in line with the word. And sometimes our logic, because of um, the circumstances that we live in, being a fallen world, sometimes our logic doesn't match up to the most High's word. But we have to remember where the logic and the ability to think and brain power came from. It came from the Most High. So when we are going through these scriptures, we need to use our own understanding of what is written rather than the traditions of religion and the feelings that we may have attached to those things. Because many of us are coming from places where we've had to learn some things that now have to be unlearned. And it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. So I'm going to encourage you to seek part one and part two of the teaching. Again, link being in the description. So it will help build up some foundation that will allow us to challenge some of these difficult processing of thoughts that we may have to go through. And the word verifies that. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the Most High speaking through his prophets, his believers, his followers, i.e. the Apostle Paul in this case. He said that be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of Allah. He is telling us not to be in line with the thoughts, the thinking the teaching of this world, the things that everyone will say is right or what the majority are doing, the Most High is telling us, don't be conformed to the world, the majority. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, meaning that you have to empty your mind of the traditions of this world and of men and exchange their ideas for the most highest ideas and the most highest ideas are in his word but we have to take it at face value that is the key to understanding this teaching and therefore not being offended but rather being convicted if it applies to you 
And I really want you to grasp that concept because if you do that, you will definitely be able to receive what is in the teaching. Now, I'm going to do a very, very brief top line recap of what we covered in part one and part two, because we started in part one talking about some things where we were looking at people of the Most High who are identified by his name. Because as this, the scripture says in Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, that the Most High's people are called by his name. So when we see the Most High's people, we should see his name in their names. Now we've looked at some of those things, which we know that some of these prophets we're seeing on screen, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Samuel, and Yasharel or Israel, um, these prophets were called by the Most High's name. And as I said, we've looked at the teachings as to what the names mean and that the Most High's name, his title is in their names. And what I said in part one is that these, in some cases, it's easy to identify because you can see it in the word. And if we look at the meaning of that word, what that word meant in the original language, the Hebrew, that the, these prophets had the Most High's name characteristics title in their name and these were easy to identify and we also looked at some other prophets who actually had the most highest name in their name now in order to identify the most highest name in their name we first need to know what the most highest name was and as we know that the most highest name although it has been changed but his name will never change. His name is always his name. Now, the original name, the Hebrew words, the four letters in Hebrew, which form the tetragrammaton, we know as we call it out in our English would be the letters YHWH, which is the personal name that the ancient Yasharelites use for calling the Most High. And to the best of our ability, to the best of our knowledge, as we study those texts and study those languages and see what they mean, the Most High's name, according to the Tetragrammaton, is Yahweh. And often we will say Yah for short, which is the prefix of his name. And that every credible scholar unequivocally would say that Yah is the prefix of the name of the Most High. Yahweh is the name, his full name that we would call on. That was the Tetragrammaton, those four letters. But Yah is the prefix of his name. Now the Most High confirms this by Second Chronicles 7 and 14 by telling us that his people are known, are called by his name. So when we look now at the prophets, Although we see that the spellings may be different, although we see that the pronunciations may be different, but we see the Most High's name in all of his prophets' names. And we see the meaning also as to what it means. So we know that Yah, the name of the Father, the Tetragrammaton, or the first part of the Tetragrammaton, we know that Yah is in their names because we can see it when we call the names Jeremiah, Zechariah, Nehemiah, Obadiah, Isaiah, Zephaniah and even when we say hallelujah we know the Most High's name is in there so it is confirmation of what is written in the scriptures and when we see Messiah and we see his name Yahawashai now I'm saying his name in the Paleo Hebrew the original Hebrew of what the ancient Yasharelite would have spoken. We see that the name Yahawah is in the name Yahawashai. The name Yah is in the name Yahawashai. Now I want to take a bit of a moment to um, make a statement that is needed for this teaching. And that statement is that I am not being dogmatic about pronunciation and I am not being dogmatic about spelling because in the age we live in today obviously I am an English speaking person that's the language that I was brought up in that's the language that I learned as are most of you watching this this video but 
when we talk about languages, we are not talking about the translation of languages because languages need to be translated in order for other people to understand. That is not an issue. What we are focusing on in this teaching, and this is why you have to watch part one and part two so you understand the process as to how we build this foundation, is we are focusing on the meaning of the word or the meaning of the name. So I'm not being dogmatic about pronunciation or about spelling, and many people will use the modern forms of the prophet's names or even for the son of the most high, the modern forms of his name, which may be in um, the Aramaic or which may be in the uh, Hebrew, but the more modern Hebrew. For this teaching, I am using the Paleo Hebrew because I believe it is the purest form of the original name. But as long as the meaning is still the same, whatever name you are using, that's what we are focusing on, the meaning. And the meaning of the Most High Son's name has to mean that Yah, Yahweh, the Father, is salvation. So if the name you are calling Messiah means that Yah is salvation, then that is the name to use, as long as that's what it means. So that's why I'm not dogmatic on the pronunciation or the spelling or the version that you are using. I am dogmatic about the meaning. Does what you are saying mean what it is supposed to say? In the case of Messiah's name, does it mean that he, his father, is salvation? And the salvation of the father comes through the son. And that is why the son comes in the father's name. But we'll look at that in more detail later on. But the key thing is, as we've seen in part one and part two, is that we have to speak into existence the things that we want. The things that the Most High has in his will has to be achieved through men because the earth was given to men. The earth was given to Adam and Eve to have dominion. And although they messed up, the Most High's gifts are without repentance. Because if the Most High was had gifts that were with repentance, he would have taken the earth away from Adam and Eve and started all over again. But no, he gave them the earth. So they were to have dominion. So just because they messed up doesn't mean the Most High is going to take away that gift. Even up until day, men still have dominion on this earth. And that is why I've covered this before. When the Most High sent his son to this earth to reclaim dominion that had been given to the enemy through his people, the Most High son had to come in the form of flesh and blood because flesh and blood were the ones that were given this earth. So he came in the form of flesh and blood, the representation of the Most High in flesh and blood form, which we will see later on, he came in that form and was able to take dominion of this earth because he was in a physical body. The physical bodies of men is what this earth was given to. And that's why when the Most High accomplishes something, he accomplishes it through men. Therefore, when he is going to accomplish giving you salvation, it is going to come through a man and that man is his son, the only begotten son of Yah. So I really want you to understand this concept that this teaching is about the meaning of the name and why it is important to get the correct meaning because we are bound by the words we speak. We're going to see this in more detail later on. It's going to become a lot clearer, but I just wanted to lay out that disclaimer because it's important for us not to get too hung up over the technicalities. And this is a tool that the enemy will often use in the body of Messiah is that he will use the technicalities to try and discredit the whole thing. In other words, throwing out the baby and the bath water. It's not the technicalities. It is the meaning that we are honing in on. That is what is the most important thing because you is speaking words of life that's why speaking is so important with your mouth and the most high has given us tons of examples some of which we're going to look at so let's get into this uh teaching we've seen that the most high's people his prophets are called by his name we've seen that 
his son is called by his name and we can see the meanings of these prophets names when we look at it in the original form the original language spoken that Yah's son's name means that Yah is salvation it has to mean that because when it says you must call on the name of the most high to be saved that in effect when you call the son's name is exactly what you are doing you are calling the father saying yeah you are salvation it is you who saves and we know that the father saves through the son john 14 6 no man cometh to the father except by him so we can see very clearly that the link between the meaning of the name is actually what the scripture says now let's move forward so we can see some things and challenge ourselves and i'm going to go back to what i said before at the beginning we need to remove the traditions of men the tra tra traditions of religion the traditions of inheritance we need to remove those things from our mind and read the scriptures as we see them and interpret what they're saying let's get the understanding based on what is written knowing that Yah says what he means and means what he says. Now, in part two, we also looked at how the Most High uses the words of men to speak things into existence. And we saw an example that happened in Genesis chapter five, where the Most High's plan of salvation was literally hidden in the names of the patriarchs that were listed. And we saw that in the second example in Genesis 12 onwards, when Abraham at the time was called Abraham and how his meaning of his name literally brought to pass the promise that the Most High gave him. We also saw that the Most High gave us an example at the very beginning. And the example was that he spoke into existence his creation. As we see on the screen, the first thing he did was to speak and say, let there be light. And because he believed it in his heart, it came to pass and light came and he saw that the light was good. And he gave us that example to follow as men because we are made in his image and in his likeness. So how he operates is how we should operate. And that is the example. The very first thing when we open our scriptures at the beginning, that's the first thing we see the most high do. They say first impressions last. Absolutely correct. The first impression we get of our Most High when we read what his word says is that he spoke into existence his creation being light that he divided the day from the night. He spoke it. He believed it. It came to pass. Now, when Messiah came again in part two, we saw that he also gave us a clue by saying that we need to ask, we need to seek and we need to knock. And we can see a small hidden clue within those processes that tell us that we need to ask the first letter of a is asked that's why he said ask first then he told us to seek the first letter of seek is s and then he told us to knock the first letter of knock is k a s k is ask and again i go back to what i said in these teachings that these things are not coincidences although they may seem to be so but this is the intricacy of the most high that he's able to do anything he wants he's able to put any message in any form he chooses so we have to take these things and use them and believe in them because they are true they are not just by uh, design they haven't just happened there's been intricate planning that the most high has done it always takes me back to what um, john said in the end of john 21 when he said that these things have been written so that you might believe and he says something along the lines of if all the things that messiah did if all the things that the most high did were put in a book there wouldn't be enough space on the whole of this earth to contain those things absolutely correct because this is an example of that so many things the most high has done that we just cannot comprehend and would not even believe or understand. And if he was to reveal it to us, we would be here for eternity understanding these things. And maybe that's what will happen, but that's for another day. So let's move into this teaching with regards to the power of the words that we speak. Now we know that the Most High's people are called by his name. And the Most High said in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. There is a huge emphasis on the power of the tongue. 
the mouth. There's a huge emphasis on speaking because death and life can be brought to pass through the power of the tongue. Do not take this scripture lightly because this scripture is in a nutshell the caveat to the whole teaching. Death and life are in the tongue's power. It is in the power of our mouths. And there are many scriptures that verify this that we're going to see as we go along. And so it is when it's about calling the name that gives us salvation. That is something that is in the power of the tongue. There is a reason the Most High said this. Now look at how important he takes words. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, Messiah said this, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So if we are ever in any doubt about the importance of our words, that words have meaning and words have power and death and life is in the power of the tongue, we only have to read the scripture we just saw that by our words, we shall be justified. It doesn't say by your actions or by your thoughts. It says by our words, we shall be justified. And by our words, we shall be condemned. Now, that can seem strange because we're thinking, well, surely actions speak louder than words. So surely what I do is more important than what I say. But Messiah... The one who knows no wrong, his own word said, by your words will you be justified and by your words you will be condemned. So again, we need to throw out our ideas and exchange them for Messiah's ideas because his ideas are always right. So since he said that, we need to take very special attention that he is focusing on our words. Now, there is a link to our actions and we're going to see how that pans out later on. But... Death and life is in the power of the tongue. That is where it starts. That's why you have to speak things into existence. The Most High showed us that in Genesis chapter 1. And Messiah is showing us that again in the scripture we've just read. That our words, the power of our tongue, speaking things into existence is how we will be justified. And likewise, the same power of the tongue is how we will be condemned. So we know that these things that Messiah spoke are always in line. They're always in synchronization because he only speaks truth. And he also said in Luke chapter 6 verse 45 that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. And this is now where Messiah sums up what he said previously, because for the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So whatever is in the heart is what the mouth will eventually speak. Now, sometimes people can have things in their heart, but say something else just to appease you or they can lie or it's not always what's in your heart is that what that's what comes out of your mouth. But Messiah is saying here that eventually what you are, what you have in your heart is what is going to come out of your mouth. And since he said it, we know that it is true. And you can see sometimes somebody who can hide behind words and say things that they don't mean just for a particular reason or for, you know, to deceive someone or whatever it may be. But ultimately that person's character will eventually come to the forefront. That's what Messiah is speaking here. So your actions are going to marry up with what you speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, this scripture here tells us a lot and we're going to come back to it later. But in essence, it's telling us about how to be saved. It says that if you confess with your mouth, the master Yahawashai, and believe in your heart that Allah raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And there's a full stop there. And there isn't any other extra things it's telling us to do, except it starts to now explain in verse 10 of Romans 10 
and um, 9 to 10. In verse 10, it says, because or for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it's telling us that we need to confess the name of our Messiah. And we also, because it's and, it's not or, so as well as confessing his name and confessing that he is Messiah, we also need to believe in our heart that the Most High raised him from the dead. And if we do those two things, according to this scripture, we will be saved. And it tells us why. It says, because with your heart, that is how you believe unto righteousness. And with your mouth, your confession is made unto salvation. Now, this goes back to what I said previously about what is in your heart is what your mouth will speak. And what Messiah said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth um, speaks. It's directly in line with that. He's saying that it's with your heart that you believe unto righteousness. You believe. And when it says your heart, it's talking about your heart, your mind, your soul, your intellect, the, the thinking part of you. When you believe in your heart something, then ultimately that thing that you believe is what you are going to manifest on, what you are going to, to do. That's why, yes, when your heart believes something, your mouth is going to speak it. And again, I cover those people that can deceive and say one thing, but in their heart, something else is there. Give them some time, wait a little while, and you will see that the actions will mirror it's even the same, the opposite way around. Sometimes you see a good person in inverted commas behaving badly. They're going through something. They're going through a phase. They're angry. They're deceived, whatever. But that person, if they are good in their heart, eventually they are going to come good. And that person, if they're bad in their heart and they're doing good things, eventually they're going to come bad. You're going to see them for who they really are. That's where he says that in the heart, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks because it is so true that what is in your heart will eventually come to the surface and it will come to the surface through your actions for sure, but also through your mouth. And that's what we're focusing on because the scripture is talking to us about confessing with our mouth, that that is unto righteousness. Confessing with our, believing in our heart is unto righteousness. And the confession with your mouth is made unto salvation. So it tells us in the scriptures that we need to speak things into existence. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And that's why it's saying by your confession, what comes out of your mouth, that is where salvation will be attained from. And that is by calling on the name of Messiah because his name means that Yah is salvation. Now, we really need to understand why the scripture is telling us about our mouth, about the power of our tongue, because we have to say the words that we mean, just like the Most High says the words that he means. And salvation is something that can only come through Messiah. But in order for it to come through Messiah, you have to confess him, his name to be Messiah. Now, I haven't put this scripture on the screen, but in Romans 10, Verse 13, if you just go three verses further, it says very clearly that anyone that calls upon the name of the Most High will be saved. That's all it's telling us to do is to call upon his name. Now, the background to that here, we see the same thing. It's telling us to call upon his name and believe in our heart that the Most High raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So it's it's confirming the scripture that we need to call on the name because it's telling us that that is what brings us salvation, believing in his name and believing in him. And we're going to see that in a lot more detail later on. But let's not make it overly complicated. Let's read it for what it says. It is telling us to believe in our heart that Allah raised him from the dead, being Messiah, and to confess with our mouth that he is Messiah. Confess his name because his name means Yah, the Father, is salvation. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his, what is his name and what is his son's name? If you can tell, if thou can tell. 
This is Proverbs 30 and 4, where the Most High has put something in scripture that should make us think. He has said, what is his name, i.e., what is the name of the one who has ascended above heavens and descended, who's gathered the winds in his fist, who has bound the waters in a garment? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Now, we know that this must be talking about the Most High because he is the one that has done those things. If you read in the scripture, if you read in Job and other places, we see he is the one that gathers the winds in his fist. He is the one that has bound the waters in a garment. What is his name? And what is his son's name? Can you tell me? This is what he's saying. So this should already provoke us into thinking that surely it can't be a name that everybody knows because if everybody knows it, according to the scriptures we've just read, that if they call on that name and believe in their heart that the Most High raised the Messiah from the dead, then they will be saved. But what the Most High is telling us here is he's telling us that, do you know my name? Do you know the name of my son? Can you tell me? So we have to now say, well, yeah, let's make sure we know what his name is and not be following what we have been taught that his name is or not be following the traditions of what his name is, but actually proving what his name is and what the name of his son is. Now, Yah's name in the Hebrew pronunciation is in the title for Messiah, Hamashiach. Now, you could look at that and say that is a coincidence, Hamashiach. But like I said at the beginning, Yah puts clues in scripture in various places and if you really focus on those things, you will see the clues. Hamashiach. Now, the meaning of Messiah in the Hebrew or Hamashiach, which is the Hebrew for Messiah, means the anointed. So we know that it is a proper title for the Messiah who is coming because he is Yah's anointed. And we see just in the pronunciation, not in the spelling, but in the pronunciation of his name, by saying Hamashiach, somehow, someway, Yah's name is in there. Coincidence? I'll leave that to you. We also see that Yah's name is even in the English pronunciation for the title Messiah. 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 And again, although this is not about focusing on pronunciation or spelling, but we can't ignore some of these clues that I believe Yah has purposely put in, therefore they are not coincidences. But again, if you want these little caveats here or there to make you see things from a more spiritual perspective, bearing in mind Yah is a spirit, there are a couple little clues here that even by saying the title for Yah's only begotten son, Yah's name some way in some shape or form is in there. Okay, now I want you to look at this scripture in the King James Version, which you can see on screen, Isaiah 42 and 8, where it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. This is how it is written exactly in the King James, which I put on screen. That he is saying, I am the Lord, that is my name. Now we know very well that Yah is not a man that can lie. And he is not a liar. And we've just seen a scripture, according to the KJV, where Yah is speaking. This is coming from him. And he is saying, according to the KJV, I am the Lord that is my name. Now, Yah is not a liar. But at the same time, we've also seen by the Tetragrammaton that his name is not the Lord. So if that scripture written in the King James is true, it makes Yah a liar because his name is not Lord. 
And if we have that understanding, then we have to question why the scripture has been changed, which if we take it at face value, it makes Yah a liar. And we know he is not a liar. It's a little bit like me saying, I am a man, that is my name. The essence of what I am saying is the same as what is written in scripture. Now we know that I am a man, but that is not my name. So we have to understand what is written and take it for what it's worth. Yah, who is a spirit, who is not like human beings, doesn't say things willy-nilly or half-heartedly or means one thing but says the other or says one thing but means the other. He is not like us. When he speaks, he speaks with definition. He speaks as a definite article. There is no misunderstanding what he's saying. He is telling us something that is literal. Now, Yah is a spirit and he can speak to us on many different levels. I accept that. But when you are taking scripture as it is written, you have to take it at its word. Because if it is not, then it makes you a liar. And this whole universe would self-destruct because we are held together by the integrity of his word. So when he says, I am written in the KJV, when it says, I am the Lord, that is my name. We have to stop right there and say, could Yah have said that when his name is not Lord? Again, I go back to what I said. My name is Daniel. I am a man. But a man is not my name. So the Most High would not same way make a statement that is actually not true. And that's what that scripture is showing us in that form that it is written. Now, if we look in more detail at how it should be written it would have said i am yahweh or i am yah that is my name and my glory will i not give to another neither my praise to graven images now that scripture when it is translated properly makes yah a truth teller which he is because he is saying what his name is. He is saying, I am Yah, I am Yahweh, that is my name. And that is absolutely correct because that is the name that was in the Tetragrammaton that was replaced over 7,000 times in our scriptures. So that should tell us a lot. Because if his name was removed, and another name or another title was put in its place that he did not authorize, then if you take the scriptures on face value, meaning you're using your understanding of the words written to interpret what the scriptures mean, you would have to read it as it's written in the KJV and say, but that is not true because his name is not Lord. And in 1 Chronicles 16 and 29, the Most High says, give unto Yahweh the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship Yahweh in the beauty of holiness. So this is verifying that his name has glory, that glory is due unto his name. Now, we know if it was in the KJV, it would not have said give unto Yah or give unto Yahweh the glory. But we have already seen in the previous verse that his glory he will not give to another. So therefore his name is attached to glory and that is why his name has to be used. And these scriptures have to be used with his correct name in order for the scripture to make sense. Because if he's not going to give his glory to another, then surely his name cannot be given to another either. And also, likewise, another name cannot be given to him. It has to be his name. And that's why the scripture focuses on calling a name, calling his name. Now, the Lord, as I've already mentioned, is not his name. It is just a title. But being honest, quite frankly, it isn't a good title because it is generic and not specific. In other words, there are many men who have the title Lord, 
be it in the courts where you refer to the judge as Lord, be it in when people go to the role of honours and are, and are honoured for whatever achievements and given the title Lord. There are many men that have that title. And in addition to that, there are many spiritual beings that have that title. And when you look in the book of Daniel, when Daniel saw the angel Gabriel, he referred to him as my Lord or the equivalent. When Sarah was um, referring to her husband, Abraham, she referred to him as my Lord. And also when you see some of the spiritual beings that hide behind idols like Baal, they are also given the title Lord, if you look at the meaning of the word. So although Lord is a title, when referring to the Most High, it is not a good title because it is not specific to him because there are other deities, other human beings that can also share that title. Now, for me, I know that the title of the Most High has to be specific, meaning that no other person could ever claim that that title belongs to them or they could use that title. Now, Yah himself acknowledges that there are other gods in his very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And Hasatan is referred to as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, I believe. So you see, if Hasatan is a God, and I know people say it's a small G-O-D, but forget how it is written, he is a God. And the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods, meaning that the Most High is acknowledging there are other gods in whatever form that they are, whether they're idols, whether they're spiritual fallen angels, whatever they are, he is acknowledging that there are others. And he's saying you should have none other before me. That is his first commandment. So if those other deities are known as gods or lords, then surely your creator, who is above all, who is eternal, cannot be given that same title as another. It does not make sense. If you want to give the Most High Yah a title, then make sure it is specific and not generic. Because as I said before, these titles are generic, they're not specific. We need to give the Most High a specific, not generic title, like the Almighty. Now again, take the word for what it means. The Almighty means... He is all mighty of all beings. There are none more mighty than him. So because the most high is the almighty over all, there is no other being that could take that title because it would be a lie. If Hasatan said, I am the almighty, we know that that would be a lie because Hasatan is not the almighty. He was created. So he can't take that title. And as it is with the title, the most high, because the creator of man, the creator of heaven and earth, he is most high of all beings. There are no other beings higher than him. And again, Hasatan cannot say he is the most high because he would be a liar, which we know he is. But his lie will be exposed immediately because he is a created being. Now, let's remember Ephesians 6 and 12, that there are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of dark places, in, in higher places, there are other rulers uh, that have been given power, that have been placed in high realms, according to Ephesians 6.12, but they are not the highest, they are not the most high, so they can't have that title, the most high cannot be misinterpreted as to who you are speaking about, because the most high means there is nobody that is higher and that's why that is a legitimate and appropriate title for the creator, because it does exactly what it says on the tin. It tells you he is most high and that's exactly what he is. And another title is the eternal. The eternal means there is no beginning. The most high has no beginning and he has no end. He is not a created being, but he is the creator. 
So he is eternal. Allah is eternal. The father, the son being Allah is eternal. And no other creature, creation can say they are eternal. So again, that is a good title for him because it shows that the title is specific and not generic. Now, sometimes we look at these things and just say, yeah, but they're just words, they're just titles. I mean, let's not get too hung up over it. And that is what mankind will have learned through tradition and through the way scriptures have been manipulated and changed to kind of just be a name. That's what the society today is. Everyone gets whatever name they want. People make up names to call their children. They don't have meaning. People claim titles that are not even applicable to them. They don't have meaning. We have been dumbed down to have this perception in the society we live in that these things don't really matter and what matters is what's in our heart and so on. And we're going to see some of that a bit later on. But I tell you to the most high, it does matter because he is very deliberate and specific with what he says. And he always means what he says and always says what he means. So when we begin to look at scripture and take it for what it is written, we know that when the most high gives you a name for him, his title, his name, we know that it is important, which is why he puts it in his commandments, that his name should not be taken in vain. And these things are things that, again, as I said, we have to strip out religion and we have to strip out what we have inherited. And we've all inherited, myself included, the things I learned from whether it was from school, whether it was from what I read in the physical Bible, whether it was from my parents, whatever it was, there were things that I've learned that were inherited. But we have to get to a place where when the most highest building a relationship with us, we are willing to put aside our inheritance if they are not in line with Yah's word and exchange those ideas for Yah's ideas, which are in his word and take his word at face value as in what it says, because he is deliberate in what he says. And I always say that mankind can change the words in the scriptures. They can remove and have removed names and replaced them. They have removed locations and uh, backgrounds they've removed many things in the scriptures and replaced them with other words that can be done and it can give a false interpretation but what, what man cannot do is they cannot corrupt the Rek HaKodesh the Holy Spirit that is the revealer of all truths and that's why Yah has allowed people to do these wicked things because he knows that at the appointed time and for the appointed people they will get the truth through his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to them and teach them these things. So it's not a problem that these things have happened. It's all going to work together for good. But the question is, are you going to make a change? Are you willing to make a change based on what you are learning? Or are you going to stick to your traditions, stick to what you've been taught and say, I believe that the Most High is okay with that? Because if you believe he is okay with that, you genuinely have to look through the word and say, maybe I'm misunderstanding the word. It doesn't mean what it says, because if you take it for what it says, you can't come to the conclusion that these things don't matter because of how it's written in plain English in the scriptures we read and how many times it is written. And this is something we're going to now start to look at now in the spiritual realm i want you to consider this that there is a court-like setup when it comes to how the most high deals with his beings and the spiritual realm we see in many places in scripture like in some of the psalms in the courts we see it in the book of Zechariah. We see it in Job chapter one, when the sons of Allah had to appear before him and Hasatan also came with them. We see it in the Apocrypha in many of the removed books. And we have to understand that setting by what's written in the word, but also by thinking about our court system in this earth, because it is a replica. Now in the court system in this earth, 
there are following roles which are given. And you have the prosecution. The prosecution represents the state or in the spiritual case, the world. And the prosecutor, the one who is the prosecutor is the accuser of the brethren, which is Hasatan. You see that in Revelation 12 and 10. He is the prosecutor. He is the one that brings the case of the world against the defendant. And the defendant is quite simply the person who is being prosecuted. That is you. That is me. That is humanity. The human beings, Yah's creation, are the ones who have been given this earth. We are the ones who are on defense. And Hasatan is accusing us. And then we have the defense lawyer. We are the defendant. Then we have the defense, the one who is our defender, who is the mediator, Yahweh Shai HaMashiach, our Messiah. See 1 Timothy 2 and 5. That is his role. If he is in your corner, he is your defense. He is your mediator. And then we have the impartial judge who is the upholder of truth. The father, Yahweh, see that in Genesis 18, 25, that he's described as the true judge of the earth that Abraham refers to him as. He is the judge. Now, the judge is impartial, meaning he is always going to uphold the law. He's going to uphold his word because, and we'll see this later on in the psalm, he has put his word above his name he has magnified his word above his name so if anything contradicts his word he will not uphold it and if anything is in line with his word he will uphold it that is why he is the judge and of course his son is the exact same because him and his son are one but the role his son plays in this court system is the mediator, the defender of mankind against the prosecutor, the accuser of mankind, which is Hasatan. And then what is it that mankind are accused on? Well, in any court system, when something gets to court, it is being judged on the law. In this case, the Torah, the word, what is written, the letter of the Lord, the scriptures. And you see that in Revelation 20, when the books were opened, the book of life and the other books and the books, plural, is referring to the scriptures. Because that is what mankind is measured against, against what is written, because the Most High puts his word above his name. So this is the court like setup. And when Hasatan has something against you as we saw in the book of Job that he went to the most high accusing Job based on a situation this is how he operates he will accuse us of falling short of the Torah and we have our defense our defender if we're in Messiah he is our defense and we have the true part impartial judge the father who makes the decision but he only makes the decision based on what is written, the correct interpretation of what is written. And we know that this must be the case because Messiah said, For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law or from the Torah till all be fulfilled. This was in Matthew 5, 18. So we know that even up until now, since heaven and earth have not passed away, that that law must always be upheld. It must always be relevant until all be fulfilled. So Hasatan has a case built upon this. This is what he builds his case on. He is just looking for one area in the law where we have broken or not complied with just one thing is he's looking for whatever that thing is he'll find one thing and that's what he will accuse us on now messiah's sacrifice death burial and resurrection when we receive him as our true passover lamb his blood is the atonement for our sin for us breaking the law his blood is the full and complete atonement that's why he's our mediator that's why he's our defender 
But the thing he cannot and will not do is he will not violate our free will. And the Most High himself will not break his word that he has magnified above his name. As I said in the Psalm 138 and 2, it tells us that he has magnified his word above his name. He will not violate our free will. Which means that when the Most High said something in his word, he's not going to change it. In this case, if he says we have to call on his name for salvation, he will not and cannot change it. We have free will whether or not we're going to comply with that. He won't violate that free will. He has given us that free will. So you see, in the court system, Hasatan looks for one thing that we've broken the law against. And he accuses us to the father, the judge. And the defence, our Messiah, fulfills all the requirements through his death, burial and resurrection. So we are delivered from that offence that Hasatan has accused us of. But if Hasatan knows the law and knows that part of the law is that you have to call upon the name of Yah for salvation according to the scriptures, something we're going to see very clearly later on. And that's why I'm explaining this process. If he knows we haven't done something to be compliant with the word, he will also accuse us on that. That person hasn't called on your name. And if the Most High, just because he likes us, just because he's got good feelings to us, just because he knows that, well, in our heart we believe, if he now complies and says, I know that person hasn't called on my name, they've called on the name of another, but I'm going to save them anyway because they're a good person. The Most High has broken the law. He has broken what is written. Because what is written says that you have to call on his name in order for salvation. So if you call on another name, he can't save you without breaking the law. And he is not going to break the law for anybody. So therefore, we have to get in line with his thoughts in order to be compliant with the law. If the law says call on his name for salvation, we have to call on his name. Then the accuser of the brethren cannot go to the Most High and accuse us of not being compliant with the law because we've done what the law says. And as I said, man does sin. Sin is the transgression of Yahweh's law. First John 4 and 3, transgression of the law is breaking the law, not doing what the law says or doing something the law doesn't say to do. But equally so, his blood, death, burial and resurrection of Messiah is what frees us of that burden. And yes, we have a responsibility to do what we can in righteousness and to uphold and keep Yah's way and Yah's charge. But when we fall short, which inevitably we will and we do on a daily basis, Messiah's blood, if we are in him, is our atonement. It is the atonement for sin. So the transgression of the law has been taken care of through Messiah. If we stay in him, remain in his way and keep him in our heart, that's not an issue. But what is an issue is we have to be compliant with what saves us because Hasatan will accuse us of not being compliant with the law by not calling on the Most High's name. And if the Most High says but they've called on another name, but I know in their heart they meant me. Hasatan will say, well, you've broken the law if you saved them because you did not tell them to call on another name. And Hasatan would have legal rights in that argument. And you have to remember the Most High is always true. He is just, he is fair. Even though Hasatan is wicked, the Most High is not going to take away a right from him that he has based on the word. So we have to be compliant with the word in order to fall on the right side of Yah's law. So when Hasatan tries to bring a case against us, the one thing he can't say is you did not call on the Most High's name. Because if we've called on his name and it's written, that's how we will be saved. Hasatan has no case. No matter what things you've done, he has no case because the law upholds you if you call on the name of the father. And that is why Hasatan has tried to remove the father's name so we can't call on it so that he can then say to the father 
they broke the law because they did not call on your name and your law says they must call on your name to be saved. It is very, very literal if you take it at its word. But now we're going to see some examples that really show us, if we take it at its word, what this name of our father gives us. Now, Messiah said in John chapter 5, verse 43, I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. So when he comes in his father's name, he is not received. The name that he is given, that is his father's name, he comes in that name and he is not received. But if another shall come in his own name, i.e. not the name of the father, not the name the father has given, this other one will be received. Now this should make us think. This should really make us think. Because there is a name that exists that the father has not given, which means it is another name, someone's own name. This person has come in this name and everybody receives. But yet the father's name that he gave to the son, he says that you won't receive me, even though I've come in my father's name. So let's renew our mind and take the scriptures literally. Listen to what is being said and understand it. And now we are going to see exactly what Messiah is talking about when he says that I come in my father's name. Let's get into this. But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of Allah even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 12. Now look at the language used. He has given them power, the ones that have received him, to become, future tense, the sons of Allah, even to them that believe on his name. Now Messiah could have very easily said, even them that believe on him. He could have left out his name. If it wasn't important, if his name was not needed to be believed on, he would have left that out. He doesn't just say things for the sake of it. He says what he means and he means what he says. And he has clearly said here that you have to believe on his name. And that's when he will give you power to become the sons of Allah. Let's keep reading. Now, this verse is the most well-known verse of the Bible. John 3:16. For Allah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is Messiah speaking. Messiah is actually speaking here. Now, if you read the rest of the verse, which many times people don't, they just leave it at John 3, 3, 16. If you read the rest of what Messiah is saying in John 3, 17 and 18, which come immediately after John 3, 16, Messiah says this. For Allah sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved, that he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of Allah. Now, he could have easily just said because he has not believed in the son of Allah or in the only begotten son of Allah, but he doesn't. He says he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of Allah. They both mean two slightly different things. And Messiah means what he says and he says what he means. So we have to take the words that he is speaking literally. He is talking about his name. But if we are in doubt, let's continue to read. Again, in the book of John, chapter 20, verse 31, it says, But these are written that you might believe that Yahweh Hawashai is the Messiah, the son of Allah, and that believing you might have life through his name. It doesn't say by believing you might have life through him. It says through 
his name. Let's continue to read. In John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it reads, These things I have written unto you, that you might believe on the name of the Son of Allah, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of Allah. He repeats the same thing in the verse. Now let me take a very quick pause there. When you see a scripture that says the exact same thing twice in the exact same verse, admittedly verses and chapters were not um, in these original scriptures, they were added in, but it means that what was said was said immediately after what was said when you see the two verses next to each other. This is in the same verse. John is saying the same thing twice. Why is he saying that? He's saying that because of its importance. He is making, a, he's stressing, he's emphasizing that it is the name. Just in case you missed it the first time, he's going to repeat it. It is the name that you have to believe in. Do you see why the name of the Most High is important and the name of his son is important? Because that's what the scriptures tell us to do. And as I already explained, if Hasatan is able to get you on a technicality because you have not called the name, which is written multiple times in scripture, as we are seeing, and the Most High says, it doesn't matter, I will save them. Hasatan will say, you cannot, because your law says they must call on your name multiple times, and they're not doing it. And the Most High would have to uphold what is written, and Hasatan would be able to get his way if you do not call on the Most High's name, because it is clearly written. And that's why his name means, the name of his son means that Yah, the Father, is salvation. So we've seen these scriptures here, all talking about believing on the name, believing on the name of the son of Alawah, calling on the name of the son of Alawah, that you will have life through the name of the son of Alawah, that you must believe in the name of the son of Alawah. As already mentioned, that name could have been left out and it could have just been believing in the son of Alawah, believing in him. But it's not. It is saying the name multiple times. Why? Because... That is the key. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name Yahweh Shai HaMashiach, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Rak HaKodesh. Acts 2.38 That they must be baptized in the name of Messiah, Yahweh Shai, for the remission of sins. So again, we see that it is the name that is the key here. And this same Peter further on in Acts 4.12 says that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we, which we can be saved, whereby we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men. And again, when we talk about the name, we talk about what the name means, the name's interpretation. And the interpretation of Messiah's name means that Yah is salvation. And the Messiah comes in his father's name. So his name has to have his father's name. Now, in all those scriptures we just looked at, which continuously tell us, about the name of the Son. The Most High had to do something again to be compliant with his word, which he always is. His word says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established, every word shall be established. And those scriptures we have just read, we had three people who said those things, who wrote those things. The first scripture, in the book of John at the beginning in John chapter 1 was written by John Yochanan the Most High's servant he wrote the first thing about the name he is the first witness if you will and the second witness is the son himself because in John chapter 3 verse 16 through to 18 that we read 
that is Messiah speaking. Now, obviously, he didn't write it. It was written by John because that's what John heard him say. But he said it. So he, Messiah, is the second witness that you have to believe on the name. He who has not believed is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten son of Eloah. And the third witness is Peter, because in the book of Acts, we see the two last scriptures just shown on screen that Peter also said the same thing, that it's the name you must be baptized in and it's the name you must believe on. So the Most High has complied with his law. He hasn't just put it in one person's mouth. He's put it in the mouth of two and three and many others. But focusing on those three, he has put it in their mouths that they are witnessing of the same thing. His word is not contradicting. It is in synchronization. Three different characters all saying the same thing. So you have to understand that when you see repetition, in the Bible, that it means that it is an important thing that the Most High means. And the Most High means everything he says. As I always say, he says what he means, means what he says. But when you see repetition, place extra emphasis on it. When you see his name, which should have been there over 7,000 times, place extra emphasis on it. But Hasatan had another idea. That's why he removed it, because he didn't want... This constant name, the correct name, the only name to be repeating, repeating over and over again, because he knew men would inherit salvation. So he tried to hide it. And the Most High allowed him because the Most High knew that through his son's accomplishment, his Ruach would come and his Holy Spirit would be with his believers who would believe because of the Holy Spirit, because it would reveal to them all truths and bring all things to our remembrance. So the Most High has a process, he has a plan, which the enemy cannot corrupt, but what the enemy has corrupted is the physical part of the word by removing the name. And we now today just think it's not important because he has dumbed us down because of society and because of the world we live in. He's dumbed us down to think these things are not important and it's more important what you do and what you believe in your heart because the Most High knows your heart. Yes, the Most High does know your heart. Absolutely correct. But he will never, ever violate his word. And if he sees in your heart that you are seeking him, but let's say you are calling another name or a different name that he didn't give you, what he will do is what's written in the scripture. He will not deviate from that. And he will send somebody, as it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 onwards, that he will send somebody, a preacher, to teach you. He will send someone to teach you. He says, because faith comes by hearing. In Romans 10, 17, that is how you get faith, by hearing the words of Allah. So he will send someone to give you the words. And as you hear the words, as you're listening, if your heart is for him, you'll be convicted by the Ruach, which will be working with you to hear the words and understand them. And then you can now make a change and be compliant with his word and reap the benefits of that. But if you decide not to be compliant because you don't think it's important or because you haven't been convicted, just know that the Most High is not going to break his word. Just the same way he's not a respecter of persons, he's not a respecter of persons when it comes to his word as to those who are going to believe in it or who are not. He will take it as he finds it. If he finds you believing in his word, then you have to also be compliant with it. If you're supposed to call on his name for salvation, that is what you have to do. There's nothing that he can do if you're not compliant with what is written because he will not violate his word. He will prompt you. He will use the Rurak. He will use other people that he has sent to teach, to preach, to prophesy, to tell you the importance. He will give you the ability to do the research, to find out the true meanings of these things. But he cannot make you speak it. And you have to speak it to be compliant with his word, as the scripture says multiple times. So if you choose not to, you can't turn around and hold the Most High accountable because he will never violate his word for anybody. We have to change our thoughts and ideas for his thoughts and ideas. We have to conform our will to his will and not the other way around. And that's why it says in Romans 12 too, that we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
to prove what is his good and acceptable and perfect will. We have to change our perception, our traditions and inheritance that are not in line with his word to his truth and his things that are in his word that we know he means. So we've seen all these examples of these three witnesses, Messiah, Peter and John, who are saying the same thing. All we see is believing on the name, believing on the name, having life through his name, believing on the name, that we must be baptized in his name, that there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by where we must be saved. That's all we see. So that's what it means. It's very simple when we strip it back to basics and take the word for what is written. Now, since we're on this topic of baptism, I'm going to show you how by corrupting the Most High's word, you get confusion and conflict. Because when it comes to baptism in the secular world, let's talk about from a a Christianity perspective, many people baptize according to what it says in Acts 2.38, if they're reading from the King James Version. And we can see what it says on screen. The King James Version says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's how many assemblies, many churches will baptize. They'll read it word for word as to what I've just read on the screen. And they will say, that's what it says in the scripture. We must baptize in that name. Now, when you compare this to some other places, they will baptize the following way. According to what it says in Matthew 28, verse 19, in the KJV version, It says, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So you have one half of people in churches in conventional Christianity baptizing using the first verse and the other half baptizing using the second verse. But these two verses, if you take them as they are written, going back to what I originally said at the beginning, they are a contradiction because... If you look at these names as they are written, these verses, sorry, as they are written, there is no way you could say that the name Jesus Christ is the same as the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. They do not mean the same thing. No way you can say that. So it has to be a contradiction. And we know that the word of Yah is not a contradiction and there are no contradictions so therefore it means either the understanding is wrong or the translation is wrong and we know that it is the latter because we know that the son of the most high's name was not Jesus Christ so where Peter is saying baptize in Jesus Christ's name and Messiah who said what is written in Matthew 28, 19 is saying, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those two things contradict themselves unless we get the correct name. Now, if we change the name to what it should read, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name Yahweh Shai HaMashiach for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Rak HaKodesh or the Holy Spirit. If we get the name correct, we now see it will not contradict what Messiah said in Matthew 28, 19. Because the name of the father is Yahweh. Or you can call him Yah if you want to use the shortened version of his name. But Yah is in the father's name, Yahawah. And the name of the son in the Paleo-Hebrew in its truest form is Yahawah Shai. So the name of the father is in the name of the son. So when you call on the name of the son, you are automatically calling on the name of the father because he comes in the father's name. And he also says... 
the name of the Holy Spirit. Can you see the name of the Father in the name of the Son? Yes, you can. Whether you take the full Paleo-Hebrew name, Yahweh Shai, you can see the name Yahweh in Yahweh Shai. And if you only take the first part of his name, as we see many of the prophets are called by the name Yah, you can see the name of Yah in Yahweh. So the name of the Son is in the name of the Father. And what about the Holy Spirit? Messiah said in John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Which means when Messiah said in Matthew 28, 19, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, his name which contains the name of the father and obviously his name, because it is his name, the name of the son, the Holy Spirit also comes in that name. The father sends the spirit in his name. So the spirit comes in the name of the son. And therefore, now when Messiah says baptized in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, if we get the correct name is in direct agreement with what Peter said when he said, Baptize every one of you in the name Yahweh Shai HaMashiach for the remission of sins. So you see that both verses, again, two witnesses have to be there at least to establish a thing. Both witnesses are saying the same thing. We must be baptized in the name of the Son. And the true name of the Son contains the name of the Father. It contains the name of the Son. And it contains the name of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which comes in Messiah's name. Do you see the importance of this? And that is why it is the meaning of the name that saves. Because the name of the son means that Yah, the father, is salvation. So when you are calling on the son, you are specifically saying, the one who saves me, the one who gives me salvation is my creator, the father. And he gives it to me through his son. And through the Holy Spirit that his son gives me when I believe on him and call in his name and are baptized in his name. Everything is in perfect synchronization. But we have to get the right name, the right meaning of the name. Now, if you want to use any other name that is your tradition or any other name that you have taught, any other name that you've read in your Bible that a man has changed. That's up to you. I'm only telling you what it says. But my advice to you is make sure whatever name you are using for your Messiah, that name means Yah is salvation. Because if it doesn't mean that, then that name will not be upheld. It cannot, because if it is, Yah will have violated his word and Hasatan will point that out. Why do you think he put in different names and took out Yah's name? What you thought he was just doing it just for the sake of it? No, he's doing it because he knows it is what brings mankind unto salvation. He knows that. I want you to consider that Yah's word is like an autobiography of him and his son. That's literally what it is. We read his word. We read the many accounts of the storyline of how things started in the beginning and things throughout the ages and to things today and to things in the future and the end of the book. We see the story is about Yah and his only begotten son and how he saved humanity or how he is saving humanity. That is the story. That is his autobiography. It's autobiography of him and his son written by him through the inspiration of his servants, his prophets. Now, if you were to write an autobiography about you and your son, you would obviously have included in your autobiography your name and your son's name because it's about you, it's personal. 
Now, how would you feel if you wrote an autobiography about you and your only son and somebody published it and took your and your son's name out and replaced it with another name? How would you feel? Would that be acceptable to you when it is a personal story as to you and what has happened throughout the ages of the life that you've lived? Would that be acceptable to you? Would you be okay with it? Would you be okay with it if the name that was given to you that is not your name had no power to save? You would not be acceptable of a change to your name that you are given in an autobiography that is about you and your son. You would not. So why do we think that the Most High is okay with it? When his name is far greater and does what it says on the tin. There's no way that the Most High is going to be pleased with us changing his name when he wrote his story. He wrote the story of humanity. He. There's no way he's going to be pleased about us making our modifications. He doesn't have a problem translating it because he's the one who created languages. But when it comes to calling his name, his name does not need to be translated. His name is what his name is because it means what it says, that he is salvation. So as long as he is still salvation today, his name is still the same today. And so it is for the name of the son. And sometimes we just have to use these logical examples to understand the depths of this situation. Now, there's a scripture that says in Hosea chapter six that, the people of the Most High need to call on his name earnestly for his return. I'm paraphrasing. And if we want to usher in the kingdom of the Most High, proving we're in the last days, that scripture has to come to pass because the Most High is not a liar. But whilst we are calling on the name of another, it is not fulfilling that scripture because that scripture is specific that we have to call on his name. So therefore, we need to get ourselves in front of the Most High in prayer and ask him for revelation so that we can be in line with his word, so that his will will come to pass through our actions. But if we're going to have the opinion that it doesn't matter and that is what's in our heart and we're not going to change the things we've learned and we're not going to renew our minds then we will not be part of the people that are bringing that prophecy to pass, which is written in the scripture and cannot and will not be changed. It has to happen. So we really need to be convicted by these things and we need to start making change, seeing the importance, not being in two camps or being in, a, in the middle, in between both. We need to pick a side. Are we going to believe the most high's words and what is written? Or are we going to believe what we've been taught and what we've inherited? And quite frankly, the majority of that comes from religion. Religion is man-made. The most high's truth is not religion. It is just the way, the way it is. And therefore, we have to be in line with the way and do what it is that he says. He has a reason for telling us to do what he tells us to do. He knows all things. So if he tells you, that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And he tells you that you must call upon the name of the son of the most high in order to be saved because the son's name contains the father's name. Then let's just not fight it. Let's just do as he has said, because that is what leads unto salvation. He can't change what is written. Now, I want us to have a look at this, these last couple of scriptures, which we will see if we've been following this teaching, if the Ruach's been working with us, if we are taking it at its word, we will see these scriptures are currently being fulfilled. I have heard what the prophet said, 
This is in Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse 25. That prophecy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Listen to the language. Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for bow. Do you see what the Most High is saying here? That the forefathers will cause their descendants through the dreams of many to forget the name of the Most High and to be calling the name of Baal and telling every man his neighbour. That is what the scripture is telling us, that we forget the Most High's name and we'll be calling him Baal. We'll be calling him Baal literally by what title we are giving him. Is that not being fulfilled this very day? Now, I know that we do things with the best of intention based on what we think is right. I know that because I've been there myself. But that's why the Most High told us to renew our minds. He told us that we have to be childlike to enter the kingdom. A child learns what they are taught. So if we are already set in our ways because what we've already been taught, we need to remove that and go back to being a child and be re-educated correctly according to the scriptures, according to what is written, not according to what people have taught us. And the people that have taught us many of these things are not even Yah's people. Can you imagine that? That the book, that the law, the Torah was written by Yah's prophets. That they formulate the words of Yah's son. A Hebrew Yasharelite. Descendant of Abraham, Isaac and Yasharel. And those that have written our scriptures, who have preserved them and passed them down, are no longer here. Yet the ones who took the scriptures, follow the history, do the history, where did the scriptures come from? I mean, in modern day. The ones who took the scriptures and translated them putting their own spin on it are not even Yah's people. And those are the ones we've chosen to learn from. It just doesn't make sense. When we read our scriptures, we know that being based in Yasharel, that the names that we read in are not European names. They are not Peter and John and Paul. They are not names that we read in our Bibles. We know that. But when we read them, we read those names out because they are names of men. Now, it does take away some of our understanding when we don't know what their original names are. Because, for example, if you know what John's true name means from a Hebraic perspective, it gives you a bigger insight on why he was called that name and the story of his life. That the name means Yah's grace. And we see that his gospel, when you read the gospel of John, 
is about the grace. It starts like that in the first chapter, that he's full of grace and truth, as in talking about Messiah. John writing about Messiah says that Messiah is full of grace and truth. So when we understand the meaning of John's name and we look at the mission he was given, we see his name is perfectly in line with the meaning of his name. And even if we take the story of John the Baptist about how he was conceived, we see that his name means the same thing because it's the same name, Yohanan, and it means that Yah is gracious. And we see that his own mother said that Yah has had mercy on her because she was barren and she basically conceived a miracle child because he had a mission. So we see his name is linked to grace because Yah was merciful on him and gave her grace to have a child in her late age when she was barren. And again, John's name shows us that there's a bigger story and bigger meaning behind what his mission was in life, talking about John the Baptist. But we read all these names and we don't understand what they mean because to us they are just names. They are nouns. They are European or westernized names. Now, yes, it does mean we miss out on deeper meaning when we don't have the right understanding. But we're not being overly dogmatic and going through each Hebrew name and saying they have to be said in the Hebrew language. But those names do not lead unto salvation. That's why that's OK. But when we are talking about the only name that leads unto salvation, the name of Messiah, it is not OK to not know, recognize and use his true name, meaning that Yah is salvation, because salvation only comes through him and no other. And that's why for him, it is important, imperative that we get to know his true name, the meaning of it, and to use it to speak into existence, salvation into our lives, because the Most High has told us to do it multiple times. Now, I'm going to conclude with this final scripture. And. I'm going to read it all the way through, but I will elaborate on the highlighted two verses that I want to bring to attention. And this is in Colossians chapter one, where it reads in verse 12, giving thanks unto the father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who have delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible Aloha, the firstborn of every creature. Our Messiah is the in image of of the invisible Aloha, the firstborn of every creation. If he is the image of the invisible Aloha, that means he is his direct representation that is visible, that was visible when he walked this earth and will be visible when he returns. So therefore, by that verse alone, we know that since he is the image of the invisible Aloha that man cannot see with his eyes, he represents Aloha, meaning he must come in Aloha's name. He must come in the name of Aloha, in the name of the Father, because he is the image. When you look in the mirror and you see your image, the image is a representation of you. It's not going to be a representation of another. It's your image that is going to be seen. So if the father's image is going to be seen through the son, 
then the father's name will be seen in the son. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it has pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The Father is pleased that his fullness, the fullness of the Father, is embodied in the Son. Everything that the Father represents and stands for is seen in the Son. So therefore, the Father's name is seen in the Son. And we have seen that the Father will not share his name with any other because the glory is his. He will call his prophets by his name because they are there to give him glory and to show people that they have been sent by him. And so it is with his son. He will call his son by his name. If you have a son and you are a man, a father, your son will be called by your name. You wouldn't expect your son to have a different last name to you. You would have the same family name because that is your son. They are in your image. They've come from you. Why would we think the Most High would be any different? And having made peace through the blood of his tree, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things on the earth or things in heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through to 20. So we see that the Most High Son is his direct image in the flesh that we can see that walked on this earth. And everything that the Most High represents, his Son does the exact same thing. In John chapter 14, paraphrasing, when Philip was speaking to Messiah, Philip said to Messiah, show us the Father and it will satisfy us. And Messiah said to him, have I not been with you all this time, yet you still ask to see the Father? Do you not realise that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, that I am in him and he is in me? This is what Messiah's very own word said. So if they are true, which they obviously are, then Messiah's name is also the Father's name. It is from the Father's name. They have the same name, the name of the Father and the name of the son so if we are calling on another name as messiah said in john 5 43 that another will come in his name and that is the name you will follow rather than following in my name that i come in my father's name if we're calling on a name of another then we are not being compliant with the scriptures that say we must call on his name and believe on his name because the other name is not his name we can't make it any more simple than that. It is what is written. And I understand that many of the names and understanding we have has come from tradition or has come from religion, has come from our Bibles that we are reading, which have been translated and interpreted by people who the, what the scriptures were not even written for. But as it says in Revelation chapter 18, that we should come out of her. The her is referring to Babylon. It is referring to the woman who is the whore. And it says, come out of her. Be ye not partakers of her sins, lest ye receive of her plagues. It's because the woman, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, is part of the Babylonian system and part of the Babylonian system is religion which is man-made and it is false religion it is religion that has been taken from the scriptures and modified so it is a counterfeit just like how Hasatan 
appears as an angel of light, but is a counterfeit. So the product he has to offer, i.e. religion, is going to be a counterfeit of Yah's word, meaning it will look like Yah's word. It will resemble Yah's word. But when you delve deeper, when you go into the scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, hair a little, dare a little, you will find fault in the religious system. It will contradict what Yah's word is actually saying. That's why Yah's designed his word like that, to be here a little and there a little, by putting precept upon precept according to Isaiah 28. Because when you get into the meat of things, you will start to see the contradictions that appear that religion has taught us to ignore because we're supposed to go by traditions and go by the words written in your Bible that have been translated, as I mentioned, by people who the Most High did not even write his words to. It's them that have become the teachers and have taught us these things. And I go back to transatlantic slave trade when all these things began to happen and the prophecies of Deuteronomy 28 started to come to pass. And you look at our forefathers who were educated and who knew many things and who were skilled because they were from Yeshua and blessed by the Most High. And when they went into slavery... And by the time you get down now from the first generation of slave people to the second and third and so on, by the time you get down, they become lost in these skills. They no longer were educated and could read and they were taught by their slave masters their own scriptures. Their slave masters taught them their own scriptures with the spin that they put on it. And they replaced the names and they gave the new names that they believed to have power to save which were not of the most high and that is what our forefathers learnt because of the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and they passed it down to generations and now when we look in the physical bible the physical scriptures have been translated into a language we speak today but they have not just been translated it's also the names that have been replaced all of the names they're now western european names and they were hebraic names but like i mentioned before we can ignore those when it comes to dealing with man but when it comes to dealing with the son of the most high whose name is linked directly to salvation we cannot ignore it so we have to come out of that system of religion and learn the Most High's truth, his word for what it is. And when it contradicts things that we read in our scriptures, because we're going here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, we should say, even if my feelings say that this is right, because this is what I've been taught and what I know, it contradicts Yah's word. So I'm going to throw it out and I'm going to focus on the truth of Yah's word. And that starts at the very beginning of calling upon his name it's in the scriptures multiple times for a reason yah put it there because he wants his people to call on it hasatan removed it because he doesn't want yah's people to call on it but what hasatan cannot do is he cannot influence the rock hakodesh the rock hakodesh is infallible when it gives you the interpretation and the understanding it is not wrong. It's never wrong. And then you have to react to it. So I can't say in any more plain English than I've already said it. Let us exchange our ideas for yours ideas. Let's get away from the traditions and the religion of this world and focus on the scriptures as they are written as to what they mean. And if we don't have the understanding and revelation, let's ask Yah to give us confirmation. And if we're seeking earnestly, from a genuine perspective, I believe Yah will answer that prayer. And if you are being convicted by this teaching, then again, take it to Yah in sincerity and truth. And if you're being convicted in a way, it is for you to make a change and to do what it says in Romans 12 and 2, to renew your mind, not be conformed to this world. I'm going to leave it here. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and share with others. Stay tuned for more teachings coming on different topics, important topics. But this topic is one of the most important, if not the most important, 
because it is linked directly to salvation and our responsibility, our part that we need to play, which is to be compliant with what the scripture says. May Yah bless and keep you.